So our next speaker is Chad Uline. And Chad is a multidisciplinary artist finding solutions to imaginary problems. His studio practice spans a range from printmaking to installation and video. He was awarded a Yukon Doctoral Student Travel Fellowship and a University of Akron Gillette Study of the Arts Abroad Scholarship to Austria. Uline has exhibited at the Alexei von Schlippi Gallery in Connecticut, the Masmanian Gallery in Massachusetts, and performed at Dusklick Interactive Art Festival in upstate New York. He received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Printmaking and a minor in Art History from the University of Akron's Mary Schiller Myers School of Art and is a candidate for the MFA in Studio Art at the University of Connecticut. Please welcome Chad Uline. Thank you, Monica. Um, I'd like to first thank everyone for being here virtually today. I'd also like to uh, send some thanks to my graduate committee, as well as my fellow course cohort. Okay. Last summer, I found myself running into an unfortunate predicament. I had an old car that seemed to re be requiring maintenance every other week, exacerbating my financial insecurity. A phone call letting my parents know I no longer had a running car ended with an assertion from my mother that I was going through a string of bad luck. For some reason, those words struck with me and I began thinking of the quickest way to change my luck. To me, luck is a chance affirmation that results in a temporary influence on perception, whether that be positive or negative. Contemplating what options I had to change my luck while walking in front of Kirby Mill, I noticed the sprawling green field filled with clover patches. I can't remember the last time I spent any time looking for four-leaf clover, but it's certainly been years, if not decades. Although the clover's legendary benefit happened in many cultures, I rarely hear of anyone foraging for this all-natural mood enhancer. Knowing how common clovers are in mowed fields, pesticide-free lawns, it seemed to me there's a treasure trove of good luck beneath my feet if I just took the time to stop and notice. The Codex of Clovers is a book of luck. What began as a record of each clover examined while trying to discover a change of fortune became a tool to aid in the search and outcome of good fortune. Like clover patches, each book varies in size, glue bound together. They contain the number of clovers I looked at before spotted, spotting a coveted four leaf. The codex of clovers are made up of countless pressed three leaf clovers of different size, shape, and color, each placed in its own glassine envelope. This translucent minimal presentation allows me to count the leaves of each specimen as I quickly flip through the pages. After finding the one four leaf clover inside, luck is acquired and potential positive energy restored. As with any search, when it comes to clover collecting, it's all about looking in the right place. My intuition leads me to patches with a high density of smaller sized clovers with vibrant green leaves. I begin systematically removing every clover in a four by six inch square search parameter. Statistically speaking, it's believed there are between 5,000 and 10,000 three leaf clovers for every four leaf. It took me roughly 800 clovers before my first taste of luck. After overcoming the pressure and stress of success before the impending fall and frost, I easily found five more within a matter of two days. Before I began deliberately looking for luck as a grand solution, hope and possibility found other ways of permeating my work. In The Old Man in the Sea, Ernest Hemingway writes, only I have no luck anymore, but who knows, maybe today. Every day is a new day. It is better to be lucky, but I would rather be exact. Then when luck comes, you are ready. Through the process of making, I'm trying to level the playing field in a game stacked against me, creating tools and mechanisms that help me execute my plans. 
I use my skills to repurpose new and old materials, formulate inks and pigments, and bind books that prepare me for the moment when luck strikes. Beginning when I noticed a pair of aluminum John boats leaning against a dumpster outside Yukon's surplus warehouse, personal space was a tool that relied heavily on repurposing found materials into new opportunities. With the help of a friend, I dragged one to my studio where it served as a dry land vessel to create blind contour drawings of the fish I imagined. Just sitting in the boat, I was desperate to get in the water. It motivated me and urged me to take action. It was too large to manage alone without a trailer, so my urge to be independent drove me to turn it into something more manageable. After cutting the 16-foot boat into multiple pieces, I stitched the front and back together and with sheet metal screws and as seen on TV flex seal, formed a smaller eight-foot boat that fit in the back end of my SUV. Christened with the champagne of beers, Personal space took cues from artist Andrea Zatel, who creates living spaces that prompt an active re-examination of needs and routines. Zatel sees home furniture, clothing, and food as sites of investigation in an ongoing endeavor to better understand human nature. Rethinking what I perceive a studio space to be or act as, I see my studio space as that living space. A space, as Andrea Zetel puts it, to redefine our objects within the context of our own needs. Big enough for one person, personal space is a seafaring studio I can now take on the water whenever I please. I equipped personal space with a plain air artist easel, turned fishing rods into brushes, and used an old tackle box to hold my ink. And I made sure to bring along a couple life jackets at the behest of friends and family. Now I could begin drawing the imagined fish seemingly just beneath the surface of the water I was floating on. Entitled the Fisherman's Log series, a largemouth bass, stocked trout from fish and game, and a, blue, a school of bluegill were drawn for record. There weren't always fish though. Sometimes an encounter with a water snake or a memory of pond le leeches permeated my thoughts while sitting out there on the still water, making their way to the page. In an effort to cast a more precise net, I was inspired by the tools fishermen used to aid in their hunt. I recreated the fishing experience inside my studio so I could have complete control over each variable while constructing a fish finding tool that allowed me to see beneath the surface. Fish Finder lets me see into a seemingly unknown space and make drawings of a space I wouldn't otherwise be able to. Equipped with a camcorder sending a live feed of screen printed images of the water below, the installation includes animation of moving fish playing on the monitors set beneath the boat and drawing tools provided for catching the next target. In his book, Catching the Big Fish, artist and filmmaker David Lynch says, ideas are like fish. If you want to catch a little fish, you can stay in the shallow water. But if you want to catch the big fish, you've got to go deeper. Down deep, the fish are more powerful and more pure. They're huge and abstract, and they're very beautiful. As I bring outlandish ideas to realization by digging deeper into uncharted territory, I discover new ways to persevere and continue forward. I'm motivated by making the impossible possible. There's an underlying urge to see something that may not be visible. With Fish Finder, I was able to manip manipulate this act of fishing to produce an opportunity of guaranteed success. This controlled simulation of an action recreated the peace and solitude of an eventful day on the water, catching as many fish as your cooler can carry, or reminded me of days sitting by the water thinking of new ideas, ignoring my fishing pole. Moving my eyes from underwater to in the sky, I don't think I could spend time in Connecticut and not think about work bird watching. Coastal forages, forested regions throughout New England are flush with birds, reminding me of days spent on long drives, drives as a kid, driving through marshlands along Lake Erie with my grandfather and parents looking for a local eagle's nest, 
It's like an out of body experience looking through binoculars as a kid. It'd be hard to say there's not part of me that gets excited when I notice a cardinal now. To help me better understand and keep from spooking the birds, I build a nest to disguise myself and blend in with the surrounding. Weaving together lightweight lumber strapping for the overall structure, I incorporated a camera feed to the trees outside my studio and other necessities for 24 seven surveillance. While constructing the nest, I couldn't help but think of more recent experiences of bird watching, particularly YouTube live streams and the voyeuristic ability to see a close up aerial view of a nest or other majestic birds from the comfort, comfort of your own home. That's Chad. Oh, wow. The fact that I had recently visited Avery Point with my brother Change. and his partner so my dad could take a screenshot of us on a webcam might be why this was so fresh in my mind. But I also can't ignore art history either. And one of my favorite works by contemporary artist Elm Green and Dragset, who cut a hole in the gallery ceiling, allowing visitors an inside look into the apartment of the gallery's upstairs neighbor. In How Are You Today, Elm Green and uh, Dragset dry, direct the viewer's gaze towards the unnoticed in every day of apartment living. In Nest Cam, I direct the viewer's gaze to the making of the drawing the process that goes equally unnoticed by the viewer. After setting up my phone's camera and going live on YouTube for the first time, I quickly realized viewing this work through the live stream was far superior than just seeing me work in the nest in person. The mystery and distance that translated through the watching of the live stream became far more captivating to me. While spending time in the nest, I began working on a new book titled Birds I've Seen, which relied on rules from the American Birding Association told to me by a professor. This rule states that by hearing a bird, it counts as an encounter because the bird must exist to be able to make that call. Each time I hear a bird now, I imagine what that bird may look like and the sound and record this in my, in my book slowly keeping track of all the birds I've encountered. Although I enjoyed spending time in the nest, I still missed being outdoors among the trees and the birds. I began working on Bird Box, an all-in-one artist kit to facilitate bird spotting in the field. Featuring receptacles for brushes I made from bird, bird feathers and inks I derived from shagbark hickory nuts collected around the ground on my studio, Bird Box is a portable case for carrying my dry materials and sketchbook high up into the tree canopy. By climbing actual trees, I increase my proximity and overall chances of encountering birds, remaining alert and present while waiting for an encounter. Rather than passively sitting and watching illuminated screens of exterior views, I perch up a tree with my arms and legs wrapped around each branch for stability, compelled to pay attention to every stroke. Thinking of ways to ride the wave of good fortune that I was experiencing through my work, I turned to other forms of spontaneous luck that could feed my habit through the winter. One of the first that came to mind was a lucky penny. Considering how ubiquitous pennies are, the odds of finding a lucky one seemed higher to me than finding a four-leaf clover. But rather than leaving it to chance, I wanted to find a way to make my own lucky pennies, to generate my own form of free positive energy. My solution is the Lucky Penny Generator, a device into which unlucky cents are submitted for the chance of becoming exciting luck-enchanted coins. With the Lucky Penny Generator, good fortune starts being generated when an unlucky penny is inserted in the entry slot and quickly, quickly slides down to the first obstacle. Here the copper coin traverses a board of evenly spaced pegs that randomly jostles, jostles the penny, separated into two routes. Breaking off to the left, the first route is less likely of receiving the penny, but produces far quicker results. The penny zigzags back and forth, picking up speed and creating a loud suspenseful tapping as it hits the end of the metal track. Landing onto the next track below, as the sound reverberates against itself, the penny falls into a large glass jug, creating a plop as it passes through the jug's narrow neck. A high-pitched jingle rings out as the metal hits the glass. 
Although generating a satisfying sound, the penny is not successfully luck in hands and has been trapped in savings. The longer route to the right offers a path of more potential. Rolling down a shallow incline, the penny drops into a teeter-totter that weighs the potential for positivity. If the penny doesn't have the energy to become lucky, it falls into a small dish labeled with a handwritten sign that says, need a penny, take a penny. Pennies that, or pennies that pass the teeter-totter test follow the track along a gradual slope that turns into a jump, launching the penny to its next hurdle. This last obstacle traps bad luck pennies behind a cage, allowing only the luckiest pennies to slide out and drop to the ground heads up or heads down. If the penny falls heads up, it has now been imbued with good fortune and is ready to be picked up. If the penny falls heads down, it must remain there until someone decides to test their luck by picking it up and submitting it to the lucky penny generator. With this machine, anytime my luck runs out, I'm able to turn my spare change into good luck. The lucky penny generator is inspired by sequential activities like my favorite game show activity, Plinko, as well as Rube Goldberg machines in which an initial action spurs one action after another until an otherwise easily performed task is completed. It's the same anticipation and excitement as a gumball machine that features a long swirling ramp to the bottom or a pinball machine with a marble run and sudden bursts of chaos. The Lucky Penny Generator acts as a piggy bank. Like the old metal rocket ship bank in my basement when I was growing up, that shot pennies into the fuselage to keep saving money one set at a time. Unfortunately, the Lucky Penny Generator was built with the intention of being a site-specific wall installation. Due to the impact of COVID-19, the project has been on hold for the foreseeable future until I once again have access to a studio space. Right when it seems I needed a Lucky Penny the most, I've been left without this potential positive energy. In this free time though, I've begun researching other forms of good fortune for a new book entitled The Encyclopedia of Luck. During worldwide pandemic, while morale is at its lowest, this encyclopedia will contain every form of luck possible to bring positivity into existence. In the meantime, I'm keeping my eyes on the ground for any stray lucky sense.